Great. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you, and good afternoon, Minnesota. Uh, yesterday, we put out the proclamation to call the legislature back into special session starting tomorrow at noon um, with the top priority of uh, police reform and accountability. Come safer communities, economic gains for all, and above all else, the sense of security for every single Minnesotan. Um, Minnesotans have raised their voice. The last three weeks have been some of the most tumultuous and painful in Minnesota's history. Um, they have come to the Capitol with the expectation of change. So today I am here with legislative, member, with legislative leaders and members of the People of Color and Indigenous Caucus. These are the people who were on the streets and calling at 2.30 as their communities uh, were, being, uh, were being burned in some cases. These are also the legislators that for years have been raising their voices and asking for the changes that would have made the systemic changes where the angst and the pain that came out of George Floyd's murder could have been prevented. So this is a group of folks who know now, and they've seen it all too often. It's never the right time to address these. It's too hard, let's kick it down the road. Let's do what we can do and then go home. This is a group of people that said no more, that the time is upon us and we need to get it done. The community is telling all of us what they want. Through conversations with community leaders, through the work that Commissioner Harrington and Attorney General Ellison did on deadly force encounters in partnering with this group and community leaders, by listening to the voices of thousands of Minnesotans, coordinated and powerful set of reforms are ready to go. These things have been out there. They have been debated. Some of them have even moved through the House. But we need to make sure that they move through and are signed into law and then most importantly are enacted. And it's the group of people here from the Posse Caucus. These reforms have been needed for a long time. These reforms have been thought out. These reforms have been implemented in other places and the data shows that they work. The world saw the worst of Minnesota three weeks ago and this group up here is committed to making sure that the world sees the best of Minnesota, to making sure that never again will we allow what had happened to continue on. There are going to be proposals around police violence. There's going to be proposals on grants and rebuilding. There's going to be proposals on accountability that make sure the public sees that transparency. And just some examples, I think for so many people, the idea that when we filed through the Minnesota Department of Human Rights, the commissioner's charge of discrimination and the Minneapolis City Council picked up and banned chokeholds. And then we saw New York City and Denver and other cities start to pick up on this. I think for many, the idea that chokeholds were a thing that happened um, was amazing to them. And then there's folks who have been listening to the communities and know it's not amazing, it was a part of life that they had seen all too often. One example I would give is too, when an officer's record of force against members of the community is not gathered and put in a central depository so that we can understand when they apply for relicensing or move to another job, those have to be there. That happens with teachers, it happens with doctors, it happens with lawyers, that there's a record to make sure that you're able to understand what the record looks like. So I am proud to be here today. It's an opportunity for these folks to kick off what will happen tomorrow with an expectation that Minnesota will change the way we do policing. Minnesota will change what accountability looks like and Minnesota will start to lift up those voices that for too long have felt they haven't been heard. And we need to do it at the legislature. We need to do it with democracy and the people being lifted up. The benefit of that is not only the change that brings to the community, it restores faith that the system can work for them. And with that, I would like to introduce one of the, um, the original members of the Pocky Caucus, now our Lieutenant Governor, Lieutenant Governor Peggy Flanagan. Thank you uh, so much, Governor, and thank you everyone uh, for being here today. This is one of those moments where we are reminded that we are still in the midst of COVID-19, um, but it is uh, difficult not to hug the people who are in this room. So it's an honor to stand here with you all today with our legislative colleagues as we move towards what we hope will be a pivotal special session. We all have a role to play in fighting for justice, for George Floyd and for all Minnesotans who have not been served by our law enforcement and criminal justice systems. Last week, our administration launched a civil rights charge led by the Department of Human Rights Commissioner Rebecca Lucero against the Minneapolis Police Department. 
At the same time, our judicial branch is hearing criminal charges against the four officers involved in George Floyd's murder. And our partners in the legislature will soon unveil a package of police accountability measures that will move us towards a system where no one has to fear for their life at the hands of law enforcement. Our work is far from done. We must stand united as we take these steps towards justice. As one of the founding members of the People of Color and Indigenous Caucus, we recognize that the experiences of systemic racism were not the same, but they are connected, and we are all connected. The priorities that are being discussed today are not new, although some people are just hearing about them. They're not new, but they carry the weight of this historic moment. I hope that this time is different and that our legislators not only hear these proposals, but finally act on them. Thank you. And with that, I'd like to introduce Speaker Melissa Hortman. Good afternoon. A pleasure to be here with all of you and with a former member of the Posse Caucus and a former member of the House of Representatives, Lieutenant Governor Flanagan and the Governor. Uh, current members of the Posse Caucus who are here with us in the room, Senator Fong Her, Senator Patricia torres Ray, Representative Mahmoud Noor, our outstanding chair of the Public Safety and Criminal Justice Reform Committee, Carlos Mariani, uh, Representative Jamie Becker Finn, Senator Bobby Joe Champion, uh, my champion in the uh, Minnesota Senate, uh, Minority Leader Senator Kent, uh, Senator Jeff Hayden, uh, the outstanding uh, Chair of the uh, Health Committee in the Minnesota House of Representatives, Representative Rena Moran, um, Representative uh, Hodan Hassan, and Representative Zhe Zhang. Uh, that's not the entire Posse Caucus, but it's a pretty good representation. You know, Minnesotans have come out by the thousands uh, to raise their voices in support of justice for George Floyd and for Philando Castile and for so, so many others. We must work together to enact change so that our communities can be safe and just for all of us. The People of Color and Indigenous Caucus has been fighting this battle for a really long time. We had a very memorable floor debate in 2017 where we talked about how important protests are. Uh, there was a proposal to make uh, uh, the penalties enhanced for protesters and send anybody who was protesting on a freeway to prison for a year. And the members of the People of Color and Indigenous Caucus talked about the, the value of protest and how important protest is. And no one more eloquently than Representative Rena Moran, who said, I am the great granddaughter of a slave. And I am here to tell you that the laws are not always fair and just for everyone. Some people have to protest to change the laws so there's fairness and so there's justice. We can't just take a few steps and say that we've done something. We can't just ban chokeholds and make the duty to intervene that's already policy in 81 of 87 counties, the law of the entire state, and then pat ourselves on the back as though we've done something. Minnesotans are asking us to be big and bold and make systemic change, and we are ready to do that in the Minnesota House. With that, I'd like to introduce Senator Kent. Good afternoon. Um, hello, everyone, and thank you for being here. Um, as you can see, we are all gathered here to take a stand, to say no more to police brutality and racial injustice. And I want to take a minute to recognize how communities across the entire state have come together in the wake of George Floyd's murder to speak up, to denounce violence against the black community, to help clean up, donate food, and volunteer. It is a powerful reminder of our ability to come together, to gather, to care for each other. And it is how we must now continue to move forward as a state. It is up to us as state leaders to do everything in our legislative power and authority to ensure not a single person more is subject to excessive use of force by police officers. Right now, people need more than sentiments and nice sounding words from us. 
they need us to act. We have heard the protests around the nation and around the world loud and clear. We must protect black lives and put an end to the inaction that has allowed violence against the black community to go on for far too long. If we are to lead the nation here in Minnesota, we must lead boldly and courageously. Today, we stand united in solidarity and in support of the work the legislature's Posse Caucus has put together. They are leading the way in this work, and we must ensure that work is passed in the legislature. This work must be done in true partnership with the governor's administration, our colleagues in the legislature, and communities across the state to ensure critical legislative reforms are passed this special session, not six months from now, not a year from now. We can't fix everything in a day, week, or month, but Minnesota and America is watching to see what our first step will be. We have the opportunity to set the bar high and lead by example, not tiptoe around the issue of racial injustice. This special session, we must act. This work is ours. Thank you. And I would like to introduce my colleague, Senator Jeff Hayden. Good afternoon, Senator Jeff Hayden, Senate District 62, which is in the heart of South Minneapolis. When the news broke <clears throat> and the video of the incident was circulated and the world watched the horrific image of George Floyd pleading for his life while being held down by a Minneapolis police officer, I was both speechless and outraged at the same time. Not only as a state senator, representing that part of Minneapolis, but as a community member, as a black man in America, and as a father. Minnesotans all want to move <clears throat> through our communities without fear of our lives, our loved ones, but time and time again, we have witnessed the evidence of horrors committed against black people by the police in cities and on back roads and in living rooms and in neighborhood streets and in the dark of night and in the light of day. The criminal justice system is failing black communities and communities of color at a, a disproportional rate, and that needs to stop. We cannot ignore the voices around the stage, the country, and the world calling for change and protection of black lives. Now is the time to lead by example and to act and to advance actual change. No more stalling. No more waiting. While the legislature has no role into the day-to-day -day oversight of the Minneapolis Police Department, I support the efforts to create a new model of public safety that works for the residents of Minneapolis. That is why we're working on a package of legislation to address immediate concerns and long-term solutions that the state can implement to end police violence against black and brown communities. As city council move forward, they have states, they have started the momentum many have been longing for in order to build a system of public safety that actually serves its residents, protects and prioritizes life and health, and allows everyone to go home at the end of the day. I expect them to work hand in hand in the, with community leaders to create a new path forward. It's up to us in the legislature to make transformative change that brings black and brown people, no matter where they live, whether it's in greater Minnesota, the suburbs, or right here in Minneapolis, St. Paul area. We need to pass transformational criminal justice legislation at the state level and, I, and, and support measures that fully fund communities with resources that they need, whether that is in the form of education, health care, or mental health services. Because we know families and communities are safer when they have reliable, safe place to live, and access to mental health resources that they need. Today, we're asking Senator Gazelka to join us in a true partnership to lead the nation by passing transformative criminal justice legislation and support our efforts to redistribute, redistribute funding and resources to black and brown communities that have been failed by the criminal justice system. Black folks are sick and tired and literally suffering from people telling them to wait until the moment's right. Wait until we know more about the measures you're calling for. The question I'll end with is how many black men and women 
have to die before an urgent response is warranted in our colleagues' eyes. With that, I pass it on to Representative Rena Moran. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Rena Moran, representing District 65A in St. Paul. I just want to thank the governor and the lieutenant governor for uh, supporting police reform, supporting police accountability, and to stop police brutality that has happened and continues to happen in this state. As not only as a legislator who believes that the laws and policies that we have had our police officers working under that protects our police officers when bad actors show up and use deadly force is unacceptable. And so along with the governor and lieutenant governor and the legislature, we are introducing bills that we believe will help keep bad actors accountable for actions that are wrong. We are looking at legislation that gets to the roots of protecting bad cops. We all know that not all cops are bad. But we also know that not all cops are good. And the bad cops make the good cops look bad. And the bad cops make the institution look bad and distrustful. We live in two worlds, some of us. We live in a world where some of us sees the police as law-abiding, doing their job, there to serve and protect. And the further you get out the city into the rural community, we see and I hear my colleagues and others from the rural community talk about, you know, how wonderful the sheriffs of the towns and police officers are. You know, um, they live in the community, they know the families. We probably go to the same church. But I tell you, that is something that the black community wants to see and feel too. That is something that we need. We need that connection. But for us, for my sons, for so many others, if we walk down the street, we ride down, uh, ride our uh, kids, ride our bikes, or whether we're driving a car, to have a police officer come up behind us makes us tense, makes us sweat, makes us fearful, not because we're doing anything wrong, but because of the interaction and relationship that we have seen that comes from police officers. And so when bad people do bad things, they have to be held accountable and not be protected. So these laws is about that, these new policy provisions that we would like, that we will be bringing to the House of Representatives and the Senate is all about that. And we are asking our senators who pride themselves on law and order, who pride themselves on the sanctity of life to stand with us and make sure that we are keeping bad police, bad actors from hurting, killing folks from the black community, from communities of color across the state of Minnesota. I just want to thank you all for, for being here because we have to do some transformational work here. This is about justice. It's about justice for all of us. And I stand with a gov governor and lieutenant governor that says that they're looking to make us a one Minnesota. This makes us a little bit closer to that one Minnesota that we all look for and we all thrive for. Thank you so much. And I will pass it back to our great governor. Thank you. Representative Brown. Before we take questions, I just, I'd like to say the, the leadership that's here is, is phenomenal. Also personal thank yous here. Many of the people here are, are mentors to me, have taken the time. I have walked and uh, learned about the, uh, the beauty of, of Hmong culture with 
Senator Herr on many occasions and the contributions um, to our economy, to our culture, to, to who we are as Minnesotans. Um, I've, uh, I've walked through businesses with Senator Torres Ray and Representatives Hassan and Noor talking about um, our Somali community and, the, and the, the beauty that it brings to making who we are as Minnesotans. Countless stories. I've answered the phone um, to hear, as I've said before, righteous anger from Bobby Joe Champion, who said, the time is now. You need to move. These are mentors who've taught me, each and every one of them. Representative uh, Jamie Becker Finn has, we, we've worked on issues as diverse as criminal justice reform to chronic wasting disease in deer to understand how these all they work. These communities, this community that sets in front of you is who Minnesota wants to be. And they are crying out to have what every Minnesotan should expect to have. And I would just say one member is missing here, and Lieutenant Governor reminded me of this this morning. Representative Ruth Richardson um, told a story that, that a mother's love for a son can, can only be told, and, and you could feel it. But the sense of fear to having a teenage son um, and having to have that talk, and the gulf between thinking how she viewed Minnesota and how I do with a white teenage son, and simply asking for nothing special other than a mother's peace to know that her son can walk in Minnesota. Security. That's all we're asking. So um, I would encourage um, Carlos and others have spent the last year coming from the community. And with that, I would open it up for questions. I may let some of this, Carlos has talked about this, I, I think this training piece is really important. The one thing I would say is, is that, that we are in a totally different space in the world, and if anybody thinks the same old things are going to be able to go on after what we saw with George Floyd and the fallout afterwards, I, I think they're missing the point. But if anybody want to talk specifically on warrior training, Carlos. Thank you, Governor, and uh, thank you all for uh, being here together. I think we're uh, demonstrating the way, the fact that Minnesotans all came together, and they have high expectations of us, and um, we have a, those same high expectations uh, because this is very personal uh, for all of us, um, as good laws should be. Um, on the question of the warrior training uh, piece, uh, there is a provision here that would ban that style uh, of training. Uh, many of us uh, find it an incredibly insidious uh, uh, approach to uh, uh, the professional policing uh, that uh, basically encourages uh, and condones uh, de deadly force. Um, just go to the internet and look at some of the uh, videos, snippets uh, of that particular type, type of training. It's very bold faced. You know, uh, you got to be a predator. You got to be able to kill. If you can't, if you if you if you're not willing to kill, uh, then you should be a police officer. I mean, that almost verbatim is what one of the major traders of that type of, uh, of training uh, espouses. Officer Yanez, who killed uh, Philando Castile, a young man who went to school with my daughter uh, at Central High School, um, was trained uh, in that particular uh, part. But let me just say that uh, our work here isn't just to create laws that say, don't do this, don't do that, and don't do this. Uh, there's a time and a place for that, um, and so uh, there will be that. But the bigger story is, the bigger message is, what do we want? What kind of police officer do we want? What kind of policing do we want? What kind of public safety do we want? How do we partner uh, powerfully and effectively our law, licensed law enforcement uh, uh, personnel with uh, community members who are experts, who know their communities, who have those relationships, who know Philando, who knew George, how do we do that? I think that's what the people are asking us to do. And if we can create that, then we don't have to come up with a long list of don't do this particular type of, uh, of training. It's not enough to tell people not what not to do. It's important, particularly for our public servants, to express powerfully what it is that we expect of them. 
how we want them to reflect our values, our values of valuing uh, the sanctity of life and respecting the human rights of all individuals. So that provision is in here, um, but uh, look at the bigger picture in terms of laying out both a, a vision and a beginning process for us to build a whole different type of public safety system uh, in the state of Minnesota. Sure. Uh, forms of defunding police might come under, and secondly, this idea of violence interveners and problem solvers or social workers pairing with police to respond to some mental health calls. Many of those are domestic situations that escalate very quickly and turn violent. How realistic is it to have a social worker respond with a police officer in real time? Yeah, I'll let these folks speak to that, but I think it's, it's pretty realistic when we make it work. And I think what I would ar make the case for is, is for us not to get trapped. And Carlos, I appreciate you thinking big picture and talking that way on this, this idea of defunding. What we're trying to envision is what does public safety look like? What we want to see is that people are safe in their community. What we want to see is that crimes are reduced. We know a lot of the research around this. A lot of this happens on the front end. It happens with economics. It happens with education. But when we get a situation, especially where it's a mental health situation. The example that many of us give, we've seen it because it's a very famous training video that happened in Camden, New Jersey, where we had a mental health situation with someone with a knife that usually would have in, uh, ended with loss of life. In that case, it did not. So I think the model that comes out of this, each and every community is going to look slightly different depending on what that community wants for their public safety. But I think what this group has made very clear of, sanctity of life and a new way envisioning that. So if anybody wants to talk about how we blend some of this, um, Feel free to, but I think this is where communities will take the lead. Would it almost require a separate force of social workers and violence interveners to respond to these calls, and how would that work? In practice. Well, here's what I would tell you is when it comes to social workers, I've been talking about this forever. I think we talk about Minnesota, and I oftentimes point the rosy picture of where we rank on certain things. You've heard me say this as a teacher, we rank last on school counselors and social workers. So one of the things is of trying to find those people, trying to have them out there and trying to have them integrated into real life. Um, I think it's, you know, imagining that we're going to have a call up and that police are going to rush and social service folks are going to rush. I don't think we're thinking creatively enough to look what our communities look like, what we're asking for. And I think there's a strong argument out of this that if we continue to chase our tails and don't fix the big Big stuff at the front end, the economic inequities, the educational inequities, those are the things that lead to a lot of these situations. So I don't know if anybody wants to speak specifically. Rena? So I'm going to give you a, a concrete um, um, solution. So in the city of St. Paul, there were a group of young folks hanging out on Fifth Street. They had nothing else to do. We're closing our parks. We're closing. We don't create jobs and opportunities. Closing, you know, libraries, aisles are cut in half. They have nothing to do. They're hanging out in downtown uh, St. Paul, getting calls from business owners because they are disrupting, causing, as the business owners would say, causing, you know, chaos for their patriots. And so there's a group of community members and they called themselves the community ambassadors. And so what they did, they partnered with the police. Instead of the police showing up, taking them down to detention um, and making them part of the criminal justice system, what they did was that they would go themselves, someone who looked like them, who, was, who they trust and, and, and who they trust would show up become a mentor them, give them resources, make sure they're doing well in school. And one of the biggest things that happened with this is that those business, they, the businesses downtown, these community ambassadors worked with the businesses to give these young folks a job, just a simple job, right? In the beginning, the, we had the, the business say, no, 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 we don't want to work with these kids. No, no, you just need to get rid of them and you know, take them in, do what you need to do. But well, a business took a risk, and another business took a risk, and another one took a risk, and they all gave them jobs. It was just a part-time job, making, you know, minimum wage, but it was something for them to put into their pocket to buy a pair of gym shoes if they needed a pair of gym shoes. Research-based, evidence-based, and what we saw happening was that 
when I carried this bill a few years ago, it was the business owners who became one of the biggest champions of what was happening with community members leading in the community. Instead of, when, instead of the police coming in and creating this whole system of incarceration, bad attitudes, and all the things that happens when police show up. And so that's what we're talking about. We're talking about community members working in a partnership with the police officer to, to create the safety that we need and we want in our community. I hope that was helpful. I was going to ask Chair Mariani a question, if it's okay. If I could on this, I just want to add one more point on this that I think the, the imagination we're having, and some of you in here in this group knows this well, but I think some of you have covered this. Fifteen years ago, I had a chance to meet with Judge Cooper in upstate New York, who had a radical idea on our court system, and they were specialty courts. At that time, it was a veterans court, meaning that our veterans' experiences when they came back should have entered into the VA system, the mental health system, or job training. They ended up in the courts. And the idea of that was, is the specialty court used outside resources to divert from a system of crime and punishment to a system of, of healing and moving forward. That has now morphed into the idea of treatment courts, that people end up in our criminal justice system because of addiction issues that come to them or violence. And we start to now, instead of putting them in that situation, we put them on a path to healing. That model was alien to people. And there was the belief, oh, you're letting them off easy. You're letting them off so much easier. It's not easier. It's a different approach to it. And I, I hope we start thinking that way of that's how this is, this is the change. So please, Carlos, I think you had the next one. This is a almost embarrassing process question. And I think perhaps uh, Speaker Horman may have a, an answer to part of this question. Um, you, you're scheduling an eight hour hearing tomorrow, which suggests that you want to get all 22 items heard and dealt with in one day. The governor told us that you're going to work until the work is done. So the question is, is that your plan? Do you intend to do everything in one day tomorrow? And, and for Speaker Hortman, if she wants to follow up, is that necessary given that this is not, uh, we don't have really parameters as to how long this session is going to go on? Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, no, it's not our intent to accomplish everything in, in a long day. Uh, it is certainly our intent to hear the voices of Minnesotans, and we uh, strongly suspect that there will be lots of Minnesotans, just like there were lots of Minnesotans who came out over the last a couple of weeks, including uh, suburban moms uh, who showed up uh, in our state capitol on our streets here uh, to demonstrate uh, peacefully. And so um, part of what we do uh, in the legislature, and we do it proudly, and um, it takes a lot of patience and the willingness to sit for a long time and to keep your mind and, and your hearts open genuinely is that we listen to the people of Minnesota. Uh, that is the beauty of our democracy, of our decision making, so that you don't just have folks who are disconnected from the realities of, of the everyday people who live in our, in our state. And so the intention tomorrow is to um, be able to roll out uh, the uh, uh, the technical language, um, you know, we're, we're, we're going to come back in a few days, uh, you know, our processes that that, you know, will be amended and changed. I've got some amendments um, as well. I, I've never introduced a bill on day one that looks like uh, the same bill on the last day when we finally get it signed. Uh, so we're going to do that process, but an important part of that process is to listen to the voices of the people. And I'm thinking... Uh, we're going to be there for quite a while, and quite honestly, it's going to be a privilege uh, to be able to hear that. Let me just add one more thing very quickly um, on this issue of community-led, uh, community-centered uh, uh, policing. Um, when bad things happen in a community, when a crime or something leading to a crime happens, what that tells you is that there's something broken in that community. And when anything breaks, what you want to do is you want to fix it. You want to mend it. And depending on what that break is, you're going to use one tool, or if it's another uh, break, you're going to use another tool. And that's what we're talking about here. And this is not a brand new concept. You know, uh, not only uh, nationally, but internationally, this is a core thinking of public safety, that it should be community-centered so that when there's something broken, you bring in the tools needed for that situation. 
There very well may be times when you need someone who is an armed, licensed, professional uh, peace officer. Um, but more often than not, we're not talking about things that just landed from another planet uh, and that we have no understanding of how to deal with. We're talking about the things that Representative Moran uh, talked about. I think the people are fascinated. I think they get it. I think they want it. They have already that, that rich experience to do that because the alternative with the one-dimensional approach, you know, of a heavy use of force and the ability to use deadly force to solve every single problem is only going to be, particularly in a society that is unfortunately been handed this incredible racist uh, uh, legacy is what we saw a couple of days, a couple of weeks ago uh, with, with, um, with George uh, and that we saw with Philando and that we just see over and over and over again. Uh, so just to put a little bit more um, you know, um, character and description around what we mean by community-centered policing. You know, um, I would just say that with regard to the time that it will take, George Floyd was a son, he was a brother, he was a father, he was a loved human being, and we will take as long as it takes to address that injustice. Um, yeah, I just had a, a question. Oh, sorry, I, I didn't see any of, um, in any of these um, summaries here, the issue of having police officers actually live in the community. Uh, Minneapolis police said today that uh, less than 7% of their police force lives in the city of Minneapolis. Um, the uh, city of St. Paul says theirs figure somewhere 13 to 20 percent. What do you think of that and, and is that perhaps contributing to the problem? Well, thank you for the question and I know that it is, um, I know that we have a kind of a list here that we're working off of, but there are plenty of more uh, and, uh, Chair Mariani and, and others uh, in our caucus was put together. So we do believe, and I do believe, I think that the, the statistic I heard, and you may have the more updated, is 90% of Minneapolis police officers live outside of the community. Give me, um, yeah, it's uh, just under 7%. Just under, so that's seven, more. 7% live outside. They told me 6.95%. I didn't make your uh, mash, officers, but I got you there. <laughs> <laughs> officers live in the city of Minneapolis. So I think we're in the same point. So I think that we want to have uh, law enforcement officers that know our community. I think that we want them uh, to be uh, active in our community, and we think that uh, if that's so, all of us live in our community. We represent our community. We have to go to the grocery store. We have to go to the pharmacy. Well, there ain't many pharmacies left in my district, but as they come back, we have to go to the pharmacy. We have to interact uh, with uh, our community. And so we think that along with all of the measures that we're going to put through in the re, uh, transformational redesign that the Minneapolis City Council is working on, we really believe that this idea that there's a prohibition that you can't set the number. Um, and that really gives local government the idea to set a number. But the idea that we you can't mandate it really is counterintuitive to me, and I'm not sure uh, what former representative and Sheriff Stanek had in mind that I wasn't in the legislature. However, we think that that's a really important notion that local government uh, can set uh, those numbers, and we think that that really helps uh, with, the re with the relationship uh, that law enforcement, uh, as we move forward, has with the community. So many of you have um, said you want both short-term and long-term changes. Do you see these all as short-term changes, and what would be some of the long-term items you'd like to see? Uh, State Senator Bobby Joe Champion from uh, uh, Senate District 59. Um, I think whenever you think about real change, you think about what needs to happen expeditiously, and then you have plans for long-term opportunities as well. And I think it's important for us to remember that what we're trying to do is have a comprehensive discussion about what needs to happen in order for there to be real change. 
You'll see that even on the police accountability and reform legislative priorities, even though there are some other things that should be included there as well, that is very diverse because when you think in terms of, let's say, voting restoration, even though a person would think immediately, why would we have that there? Voting is the bedrock of our democracy. And we should want to make sure that a person's voice is being heard at all times, no matter if it's local uh, elections, school board, people should, should be heard. And when individuals are heard, then they feel as if they're a part of the process and that they can continue to work towards making this world a better place through their voice of electing the individuals and representatives that they want to have in various places or spaces. So I hope that as we begin to, uh, to, to continue to have this important dialogue, that it doesn't stop at dialogue, but it, it is a part of action. I heard a person say the other day that love is an action word. So sometimes we say we love each other, but love is demonstrated even in difficult moments. I often think about my, one of my favorite uh, um, uh, phrases that Martin Luther King stated, even though I can think of others, but one that's really important to me and I think is really important now, so as we use it as a guiding principle, it says the ultimate measure of the man is not where he stands at the time of convenience and comfort, but it is where he stands at the time of challenge and controversy. So when we think about us being Minnesotans and how we want the rest of the world to see us and how we want to impact the rest of the world, it will not only be from moments where things are good, but it's also during those challenging times when we rise to the occasion and we understand that we're joined by our human spirit and we use that energy to move forward. If I, may, if I may add to, uh, to my brother, uh, Senator Champion's uh, uh, observations in, in sharing, um, specifically, there's a, a couple of provisions here. One of the ones that I'm, uh, frankly, because I guess I'm a policy wonk, I'm really uh, excited about, is the work that uh, actually we, our committee pushed uh, something like this out uh, a year ago. Um, it, like every other issue, uh, unfortunately, uh, that addresses uh, the pain of race and racism and, and injustice and calls for a need for massive criminal justice reform. And quite frankly, uh, uh, that's not a partisan issue. I mean, there are conservative groups all across the country uh, who are borrowing from that same sense of a call to redemption, you know, in all our public systems, um, and who are pointing to the waste of our criminal justice system. The Koch brothers um, uh, had their representatives testify two or three times in our committee. Uh, once, I had to take a picture sitting right next to the ACLU uh, in unison. And, um, and yet, um, the Senate uh, did absolutely nothing. My hope is that this year, uh, the Senate will see the light, uh, because the light's been shown by tens of thousands of Minnesotans uh, over the last couple of weeks uh, most passionately. Uh, and I think it would be irresponsible and foolish of us uh, to not respond to that. But my provision, our provision, that was part of my bill uh, from last year, uh, goes deep into a reform of the Pulse Board, which is our state uh, uh, police officer standards and training board. Uh, when you think about it, it's an incredibly potentially powerful board because it is a licensing board. And so the whole issue of folks uh, forcing, uh, you know, locals to negotiate away the ability to hold them accountable uh, largely disappears if the state says, you have to do this, you have to behave in this way, uh, otherwise you have no license. You cannot bargain away what the state says is part of your license obligations. And so, um, so we're, di we're diving deep into the board itself, we want to expand its membership, so we have more civilians on that, there's partisan agreement on that. We want more diversity on that board, we want to create a subset of the board, uh, a council, that has real power uh, that nonetheless works in tandem with law enforcement to design what those new expanse, not expansive, but designs what those new inclusive community centered requirements are for a, a peace officer to secure a license in the state and to also play a role in reviewing the data uh, around discipline. I mean, here's the truth. You know, this individual who's charged, uh, who knelt on, on Brother George's neck, 
You know, this wasn't the first, it wasn't the second, it wasn't the third, it wasn't the fourth, it wasn't the fifth time in which uh, there had been serious complaints uh, against him. Quite honestly, we don't even know how many complaints, because it all depends on who you ask and who's collecting. One of the flaws of our system is that uh, we do have transparency under the law for collecting that data and sharing it, but you got to knock on each and every single police department, sheriff department, and local law enforcement to get that data. There's no standardized way to collect that data, to store it, to report it. And so the question becomes, how do we know whether things like training uh, police officers that we spend $12 million in a biennium uh, to do to address things like implicit bias, we have no idea whether that's being effective because you gotta go knock on the door on 500 plus you know, and individual uh, governmental units to get that data. That is at best a flaw. It is a, at worst a gaming of the will of the people of Minnesota when they pass laws. And so what we're doing is we're collecting, centralizing that data, creating an analysis process uh, of the data itself, and then working through that council, uh, which will be an inclusive council, which will have strong powers, it'll have subpoena powers, and then working with law enforcement to properly discipline and to properly analyze and, and uh, calibrate policy and licensing requirements. It's gonna take a while, but that's the long work of how you move systems. And we had this incredible power of the licensing board. Uh, the governor said it, you know, I mean, if you're a teacher in this state and you do something bad to a young person, your license is gone, like fast. You know, we have almost the opposite here. This is not a slam on our law enforcement. I have, I have family who are law enforcement, you know. It's, um, we have a system that's not meant to respond. Respond timely, respond in an informed way, and our goal is to be able to create that within the existing structures and strengthen them so people can believe again in things like our law enforcement systems. Issue tomorrow. Yeah, sure. Um, as I, I, I only recall vaguely, but I seem to recall there was some question, uh, perhaps it was with the Chief Justice, as to whether the board has the authority to make that decision. And I'm wondering if you've discussed that with the three members, if you kind of already have we, a deal there. Yes, the, the Max Mason uh, pardon will, will be heard tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. And uh, we believe, and, uh, and there may be some discussion tomorrow on this, we believe that the interpretation is that the, the pardon board does have the authority to grant posthumous pardons. Um, I, at this time, have not heard uh, a challenge to that uh, analysis. And I think since we did it in December, there's been quite a bit of work, quite a bit of uh, research, and quite a bit of scholarly work on it. And I think we've, we've landed. I certainly don't want to speak for the Attorney General or the Chief Justice, but at this time, there has been no formal uh, pushback that the, that is uh, that is within the purview of the Board of Pardons. I can ask a couple of questions about the statue situation sure. uh, yesterday. One of you, and then I have a question for the Lieutenant Governor as well. Um, for you, who was it that made the call to not have the State Patrol intervene more quickly? Uh, the State Patrol in charge on the ground would have made that, as they always do, assessing the situation where if it was believed that would have escalated or not would have been the, would have been the call. And I don't know who the... Uh, who the patrol officer in charge was at the time. Not have any um, input in that? Commissioner, you can talk. John Arrington, Commissioner of the Department of Public Safety. Uh, the captain who is in charge of capital security uh, let me know um, just before yesterday's press conference that there was a protest uh, scheduled for about 5 o'clock leaving from Minneapolis. Uh, to uh, and the conversation was that they were going to take down that statue, uh, statue of Christopher Columbus. Um, the State Patrol organized a team of about 25 uh, troopers uh, at the Capitol. Uh, they took the protocol that we have standard that we've always used, and in fact, it's the protocol that we use regularly when we have protests uh, to have a senior representative of the State Patrol to go out, talk to the folks that are organizing the protests, and then create what 
what are the rules we're going to have here? Uh, are they, is this a peaceful protest? Is this going to be an aggressive protest? Uh, and that determines what our position is. The captain went out with a representative from the Department of Public Safety, uh, Nigel Perrault. He's the Native American liaison from the Department of Public Safety to have that conversation with the protest leader. Uh, as they were having that conversation, uh, members of the group uh, threw a rope around the statue and pulled it off. Um, so, With all due respect, our video shows a very passive negotiation went on for several minutes where the leader of the protesters told the trooper very specifically, we're going to put a rope around that and we're going to pull it down. He then, minutes later, walked away, left the protesters and the statue unattended, and it came down minutes later. That doesn't sound like there was any effort made to protect it. The bigger group of troopers didn't show up until minutes after the statue was on the ground. Uh, I I don't agree with that. I, what, from my, what, from what I know about this is, he went out there to have that conversation. Uh, they were having the conversation. The rope went around the the statute, uh, and as the as the statute came down, the troopers were coming out of the Capitol to secure that area. Uh, they were not able to get out there in time. Governor, if could you just talk about the destruction of public property, even if it's a, a symbol that you yep. don't agree with, because you've got a very potentially volatile special session about to start. There's a lot of artwork and things in the Capitol that maybe people don't agree with. And now people have seen what appears to many in the public as the, uh, the willful destruction without any resistance from security. And they're concerned about where this is going to lead. Yeah, well, there will be consequences. There, there, this was an act of, of civil disobedience. The, the people doing it clearly understood and were prepared to take those consequences. Each of these incidents is deciding, and we've seen it in this room over the last few weeks, um, the criticisms of being too aggressive with the use of chemical weapons and other non-lethal, and, and then uh, some cases of, of, of being overly aggressive with them. The leaders on the ground have to make a decision that we're in. These people came, and, and I think um, I certainly do not condone, nor is this the right way to go about this change. I do think to uh, the public out there, and don't confuse the random uh, burning of a liquor store with an act of civil disobedience, and it doesn't mean that we're condoning the behavior, but I think to understand the motivating factors that were there, I say this as, as someone from Mankato, who has spent every December 26 for the last couple decades down on the side on riverfront where 38 Dakota were hung. There is a lot of emotion around this, as there were with the painting in the Capitol, as there were with uh, Bede Makoska, as there is with the seal. And I mentioned this yesterday. So I want to be very clear. There will be consequences for this. They will, they will be accordingly uh, to what our laws are about doing this. We are going to, and I'm gonna tell people, we have to create a system where people feel like we can have a debate and an outcome on this. But quite honestly, I think when it comes to the Capitol grounds, many folks don't know how to do that and I'm not certain they feel like there's a way to remove them. So I just wanna be very clear. I won't condone the behavior. There will be consequences for it. It was an act of civil disobedience that we need to make sure people feel that there is a proper outlet to address what are legitimate concerns around what they view as a, as a genocidal monument that they have to walk to in their democracy. Uh, you've been very outspoken about that statue. Uh, you're also a head of the commission that could have done something about it peacefully. Have you have you attempted to do that, or when you were in the legislature, did you propose legislation to remove it? So first of all, um, I'm not going to perform for folks. I'm not going to feign sadness. I will not shed a tear over the loss of a statue that honored someone who, by of his own admission, sold nine and 10 year old girls into sex slavery. So let me start there. In my role as the Capital Area Architectural and Planning Board Chair, or the CAP Board as it's called, I wanna be really clear. We need to follow a process that's important and frankly long overdue about the artwork, the imagery, the symbols within the Capitol building and on the Capitol grounds. All Minnesotans should feel safe 
and welcomed and valued when they step into and on the grounds of their house, the Minnesota State Capitol. And to be clear, the current process is not well-defined. We have had these conversations at the cap board, and we will continue these conversations because even those who are familiar with state government have not heard of the cap board. And this indicates that we need to do things differently. In partnership with the Minnesota Historical Society, we need to evaluate and reevaluate what is displayed at the Minnesota State Capitol. We need to build a process that is accessible, proactive, community-driven, and transparent. In the terms of the statue of Christopher Columbus, I wish we had a better process that had been followed. I wish the removal had been different, but I am not sad that it's gone. Columbus' legacy was setting in motion generations of violence, rape, and genocide against indigenous people who are already here when he arrived. We have this myth of a man that Columbus sailed the ocean blue in 1492. And now my daughter knows Columbus as the man who got lost and hurt people. Placing a statue of a historical figure on the Minnesota State Capitol confers an honor to their legacy. There is no honor in the legacy of Christopher Columbus. To remove a statue or choose not to place one there in the first place is not an erasure of history, but a reckoning with it. And I will just say, we've had these conversations for a long time. To answer your question, Tom, I was one of the co-authors on the need to remove that statue and to rename Columbus Day Indigenous Peoples Day, which I am still in support of. Go ahead, Theo. Um, a couple things. One is you're the um, chairwoman of mm -hmm. the GAP board. Uh, it's uh, the executive secretary told me today that it's your power to call a meeting uh, whenever you wish. Uh, when's the meeting going to be scheduled and what do you want the cap board to do and now that the statue's gone? Yes, that's a great question, Theo. Thank you for that. So the most recent me uh, meeting that we had was March 10th, uh, where we talked about how exciting it is, frankly, that a, a statue of Nellie Stone Johnson is about to be added uh, to the Capitol. And I can't think of a better person who embodies the kind of legacy that we want to honor in the state of Minnesota. In November, we talked briefly about the Columbus statue, and now we will enter into a process in partnership with the Minnesota Historical Society. Um, we'll be talking about that later today, about what that looks like, when we'll schedule that. Also knowing that we're in this time of COVID-19, so we'll have to be a little creative with what that looks like. But I am going to, to say that um, Minnesota is ready for this conversation. It is clear in this moment that these images, that the artwork, that the, the pieces, frankly, the state seal that our state was founded upon have everything to do with this moment that we find ourselves in right now. And even the two paintings that were removed from the governor's reception room when Governor Dayton was in office were placed on the third floor where there's not as much traffic. And there was some interpretation of that artwork, which was necessary, because not everyone agreed with the depictions in those, in those paintings, myself included. But in some ways, that has been the most Minnesota nice response to how we deal with racism. We're gonna take it out of this room, and we're gonna hide it away, and we're not gonna talk about it. So we are done with those kinds of processes. It is um, interesting, and I use that in the most Minnesotan way possible, that I am the head of the CAP board in this moment. I take that responsibility incredibly seriously. I will work in partnership with the other members of the CAP board, along with the historical society, to ensure that we create a capital and environment where everyone feels safe and welcomed and included, and the very important conversations that we need to have here, that we are creating an environment where people can reimagine and they can dream what is possible together. Thank you.
For all, I mean, if you're going to ca call that an act of civil disobedience, what are you going to call it if a right-wing group decides that they're going to tear down the statue of Floyd B. Olson because he was too close to the communists? Yeah, well, these are the conversations that the lieutenant governor is talking about. We we have to be able to have them. We have to create a space. I think the 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 situation is people don't feel like there's a space to have this. They don't feel like there's a space to have that discussion. And I think what comes out of this is, and she's right, it's in the in the context of the moment that we're in. We need to do that. And and I again say there will be consequences that I think are going to be fully accepted by the people who did it. We wanted to make sure, and again, this is a dangerous act. We don't want the statue falling on anyone. Um, I think many of us were surprised it wasn't anchored. I mean, there's a lot of questions that come out of this, um, but we're not, I'm, I'm not saying that we're going to condone it, but I think the Lieutenant Governor's point on this is that what that symbolizes and what we haven't talked about can lead to those types of things. So um, I, 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 I'm, I'm ready for this conversation. I, I think those are valid questions to ask. We have to have society that functions in a peaceful manner and that moves forward. Um, but, but I do think it's important. And if those who want to try and make the case that this is, this is equivalent to randomly burning or looting a store, um, by indigenous people who have been speaking up for generations. The very people who did this have been trying for years to get it removed. That's a very different thing. Uh, I'm going to go back to the previous set of topics, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, earlier this year, it was realized that the only jobs in the state of Minnesota, public or private, where a box is included asking about criminal records is for applications to state of Minnesota boards and commissions, yeah. which is ironically includes the post board. Yes. You, the Secretary of State, the Human Rights Commissioner, many members of legislature said that was going to be fixed in this past session. And as near as I can tell, there wasn't even a bill introduced. So is that something that might come back in this special session? That's a great, that's a great question, yes. And I think for many of us, many were surprised that there was a, when that was brought up last year, that that was the case. Yes, the banning the box is, is important. It, it's it's systemic, like uh, Senator Champion talked about with voting. These are not peripheral issues. They're really important. So, we can, yeah, go ahead. I would certainly encourage us doing that. Thank you, Governor. Uh, I want to thank the Governor. I meant to do this earlier just to say thank you for his great leadership. This is a very important question because I was uh, the author of Ban the Box. And so, um, that's one of those things that we thought were, was fixed and was included in the, in the legislation that we passed. It is something that we are committed to changing uh, or making sure that we close that loophole because we do think it's important for all individuals to be judged on their skills and qualifications and not on their past. And so we don't want anything that would hamper that opportunity. So we will continue to work on that. I did put forth um, a bill in order to close that um, loophole. In fact, how I found out about it was because uh, my representative, Dean, was, was seeking a certain um, a position and he, and he was asked that question, it was there. So we all recognize the importance of banning the box because we want to make sure that people can be gainfully employed and we can use the skills and qualifications in other like ways and manners. And so we don't want anything that would uh, hamper that. That the reason you, that, that a bill wasn't introduced because there was a fear that the Senate perhaps would use it to, in fact, put the box back in other applications. And there was a fear of opening that door, so that's why it wasn't brought up as an issue. Is that true? So l let me say for the record that it's not true from our vantage point because we do not fear anything that the other uh, folks across the aisle could potentially do. Uh, we think that we will win this conversation because it's not a partisan issue, it's really a bipartisan issue. And that we all should be working together, just similar to what the governor said around voter registration. What I didn't mention before about voter registration is that of that 47 to 50,000 people, 64% of them are from outstate Minnesota, where only 36% is from Hennepin and Ramsey County. So when we think in terms of this question around um, closing that loophole, we will continue to do that. It wasn't out of fear. I will say that we've had some challenges in the Senate of getting our Senate Republicans or the Senate majority to hear certain bills and to make sure that we are operating together because we, we really should all be operating uh, in the best interest of Minnesotans. And so we'll continue to call on our good friends across the aisle in order to do what is in the best interest of Minnesotans and not in the best interest of one's ideology. 
Representative Jamie Becker Finn, Roseville. Um, I'm glad that Senator Champion brought up uh, the voter restoration piece again. Uh, I, I have folks from my community reaching out to me and asking me, you know, I, I thought I was a good person and now I don't know if I'm doing enough. You know, what can I do? And so what I, I'm doing right now is, is reclaiming my time a little bit. And I know um, you all are really good at asking questions, but I want to get us back to this voter restoration piece because it is key to this entire um, this entire movement that we're doing here. Uh, Everything that's in all the other things in our package are dependent on government and, you know, d the different boards, the different commissions, the BCA, the Department of Public Safety. And the way that we hold government accountable is through our votes. Voter disenfranchisement is a way of allowing some folks to have power at the expense of others. And a concentration of power is a mechanism of oppression. So when we wonder about how we got here, you know, you'll hear folks say it's been 400 years in the making. Well, for some of our communities, it's been even more than 400 years as we talk about going back to 1492. And we have to look at how our systems were built because they were meant to benefit some people and not benefit others. And so if a pillar of our democracy is the idea that every person gets a vote, but certain categories of people are disenfranchised from having that vote, then they don't get to be part of the democracy that we're building. They don't get to be part of government. And so, um, you know, I've heard from folks, you know, asking like, how does the restore the vote piece fit in? It is absolutely critical. And when we talk about the question about long-term change and a legacy of moving things forward, giving folks the ability to vote is the most core thing we could possibly do right now to give folks a voice in what their government is doing and how we move forward. And so I don't want us to lose sight of that um, as we ask lots of questions about a statue. So I really hope that folks will be paying attention to the Restore the Vote movement because it's incredibly important at this time for the reasons I just stated. I want to close out before we'll take one more question at the end, but, but I want um, just a minute or two. I want our representatives who are here. These are folks that represent tens of thousands of people, many of them who feel like they're invisible to the system. And these are leaders that are speaking for them. So Representative Noor. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Representative Mahmoud Noor. I represent District 60B in Minneapolis. Equal justice under the law. Equal justice under the law. That's what we are asking for. That's what we want. That's what we demand. There's nothing greater than that. George Floyd was murdered in the hands of Minneapolis police. My community that I represent, the constituency that I represent, are demanding action. We can't wait for anybody else. This is the time. This is the moment. We have to get things right. Minnesotans are watching, the world is watching us. So we have to make sure that we bring justice for everyone. And that's all simple that we're asking for. Thank you so much. I want to take this opportunity to thank the governor and the lieutenant governor for bringing us together. It is about time. Many of these bills, many of these proposals have been before the House and the Senate for many years. We have authored this legislation, many people who are here, many people who are no longer here. We have been asking for this for a very long time, and we finally have a group of people that are coming together with our administration to really look at how do we put this in place, how do we act, and how we model this to the nation. So I am very proud to be part of this group, very proud to be working with this administration to bring our state together. And those people who are refusing to be part of this moment that will change the history of our state and probably will show the nation how to, how to act and how to address these injustices that have occurred in this country, better watch that video again, because that's what we're talking about today. They need to watch the video again to see what is that we are trying to change. So thank you, Governor, and thank you, Lieutenant Governor, for your courage and your leadership. Good afternoon. 
My name is Hawadin Hassan. I am a state rep from South Minneapolis, District 62A. I, um, my community is some of the communities that are impacted by the civil unrest. My community right now doesn't have uh, access to food, access to um, drugstore, access to gas station, access to a bank, access to post office. But that's only at the service. That problem is only at the service. The struggle and the injustice that has been happening in this community and many communities, black, brown, and indigenous communities, has just risen to the, up to the level that right now we must do something about this. This is not about right versus wrong. It's not about uh, liberal versus conservatives. It's not about black versus white. It's right and wrong. And injustice that happened to George Floyd and being murdered by the hands of police is wrong. And I join every single one in Minnesota to join us the route to justice. We're seeking justice. Thank you. First, I want to thank Governor uh, Tim Walls and Lieutenant Governor for calling us to give opportunity for us to say a few words at, at the end here. I represent Eastside St. Paul, um, and the damage the riot also affected uh, as far as uh, Sunray area too. Um, but as a, as a Hmong American or, or as a Hmong Minnesotan or, or as a person of new Americans uh, arriving as a refugee to this country in the uh, mid-70s, we are caught in between the racial chasm that happened for 400 years in this country. And the oppression even go further. As we can see, Lieutenant Governor had mentioned about, you know, the statue and Christopher Columbus. And so it's a tough decision for us and put us in a hard, hard uh, situation, hard scenario. Under that, the COVID-19 or even targeted Asian American as, as, uh, as, as re recipient of co-carrying the COVID-19. So it put us in, in a very, very tough situation at this time. But we are in solidarity. We are in solidarity for the people to fight for justice. Just that, justice that had harmed people of color, black and brown, and I would say black and brown, brown do, do include Asian, just so that folks that I represent know that we are part of this together. And we are part of this to, it's a test of time. It's a test of time for all of us. And it's, it's, it's tough. But let's take this opportunity to make change, change for the better. And we have to do better now. We have to do better now for the betterment of Minnesota and for the betterment of this country. Thank you, Governor, for allowing me to yes, speak. Yes, I would you another question. Yeah, I just had a question. Um, what would the leaders say, and what would, Governor, what would you say to the Republican leadership who's given us every indication that they are going to try and block just about every one of these proposals? Well, I would just, uh, I, I believe, and, and you've heard me say this for the year and a half that I've been governor, I believe that um, we're doing this as well as anybody working together. I understand, and Representative was on, was very clear about this. There are certain things that transcend politics. There are certain things that transcend um, to get to the part of who we are as human beings. I believe that the, the Republicans in the Senate care deeply that we get this right. I, I don't think they see this as a healthy situation of where we're, where we're at with uh, what's happened with George Floyd's murder um, and what's happened with the police. And, and I think that call to, to block before they've seen that, I, I think the people are asking for us to, uh, to have this discussion and to move things. So I, I remain hopeful. I know tensions are high. Um, I know that it's at times like this that things are said that, uh, that maybe people regret. Um, I think it's incumbent upon all of us to take that step back, me included, um, to reach out to try and find that common ground, um, to admit where things could go differently, but to center ourselves in, in, in what's right. And listening to these folks who are up here, I'm, I'm convinced we can do that. I'd just like to, uh, to thank you all. Thanks to the, the members of the Posse Caucus and the leadership in the House and Senate. Uh, thanks to the media for taking the time on this. I would let all of us know is the responsibility on us, all of us, media, citizens, law enforcement, teachers, legislators, um, we are going to be defined very clearly 
uh, what happens in, in the coming days, weeks, and months um, in, the, in the nation's eyes and in the world's eyes. I know the goodness that's here. I know the potential that's here. But I would, I would just caution us of believing that this is a time to move slowly or this is a time to think small or this is a time to get caught up in what looks like easy political shots um, rather than making ourselves a little bit vulnerable as legislators for the good of the state. So I'm, I'm incredibly grateful that a special session is going to happen at noon tomorrow and be very clear about it. It is going to be led by the people who stood up here today and Minnesotans can be proud of that. Thank you.